Welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter, the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist, Skip Richter. Well, good morning. We appreciate you listening to Garden Success and look forward to talking to you because this is a call-in show. So it gets more interesting when you call in and the questions you have, somebody else will probably have too. So let me give you a number and an email that you can use to contact us. It's 979-845-5689, 845-5689. Or if you want to perhaps send a photo of a plant or something by email, you can send it to Garden Success, one word, Garden Success, at tamu. dot edu. Garden Success at tamu. dot edu. Uh, we're going to start off going to the emails today, and uh, Alma had asked about some resources for uh, gardening with your kids, uh, for parents and and youth. Uh, to get out and, and to garden. And probably the best resources I can think of for that are the uh, Junior Master Gardening resources. Now you can go to Junior Master Gardening online. You can see the different kinds of resources that they have. That program was developed here, Texas A&M, but it is and actually across the country now. Uh, and uh, the JMG program is uh, award-winning, first quality stuff. Uh, Lisa Whittlesey uh, and her team that has put together all of these materials and does the educational uh, things. It's, it's, it's amazing what they've done. So uh, JMG uh, Gardening. If so if, let me see. I'm going to go make sure I get the, the email right with them. Uh, yeah, it's jmgkids.us. J-M-G, as in, as in Junior Master Gardener, Kids. Dot us. They have the uh, Junior Master Gardener curriculum uh, for various age groups, and then there's also something called Learn, Go, Eat, Grow that they produce out of the Horticulture Department here at Texas A&M that, again, is an amazing award-winning uh, program for kids. So those would be from a curriculum standpoint. Uh, after that, I, I would say, Alma, that it, it kind of depends on what information you want. Uh, I created a website, uh, Composting for Kids. So if you wanted to teach the kids about composting, you could uh, just do a web search for Composting for Kids, and I guess go ahead and put my name, Skip Richter, in there, and uh, that will bring you to it. It's a, just a series of slides that shows the steps of composting uh, with kids doing the work as they go along. So that would be an example of a specific resource that you might look for. Uh, if you have other questions, uh, how to build beds or um, you know how to improve the soil or when to plant vegetables, we have all of that at the AgriLife Extension Office. So uh, just call the Brazos County Extension Office with Ag Texas A&M AgriLife Extension uh, and, uh, or send me an email to um, the radio show Garden Success at tamu. dot edu. Garden Success at tamu. dot edu, and I'll be glad to forward some resources according to the specific question uh, that you might have and what you're what you're like and are desiring to do. Uh, so that's uh, we had a question come in from Larry and. Uh, Larry has some ligustrums that are, are very overgrown, which happens. If you plant a ligustrum, that is not a plant that is going to just sit there and be, you know, a small shrub, the height you want it to be. In fact, uh, ligustrums grow way higher than the eaves on your house and eventually almost become, well, they can become mini trees. Uh, and when they get that far along, the in interior tends to lose its leaves and so maybe you wanted a dense shrub now you've kind of got a see-through a uh, bunch of, of trunk multi trunks that you're looking at at that point that you have a couple of options you can cut them back severely 
and they will regrow. It'll really set them back and shock them, but they they re-sprout out, and then eventually, as they grow and you shear back, and they grow and you shear a little bit, you're always cutting off the new shoots coming out cutting the tips of them off. Let me be clear about that. Not cutting the shoots off, but uh, shearing off the tips, and it makes it denser and denser. So you could get back to a good size shrub. However, that said, I'm not a fan of wax leaf ligustrum. I know it's a super common shrub across Texas, but it's, it's prone to a leaf spot called Sarcospora leaf spot that once it gets in, you constantly have these yellowing spots or with brown in the center, uh, and the leaves fall off, and it just looks terrible. And the way to manage it is to spray fungicides, but you, you don't want to have a plant in your landscape that you know every year you're going to be spraying fungicides to keep it looking good. Uh, I'd, and so I would, I would shift out of the ligustrum and try something else there. Uh, but if you do want to cut it back and keep it, uh, then what I just described earlier is how you would go about that. Our phone number is 979-845-5689 and by email gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And let's go to the phones now and talk to Mike. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Skip. How are you doing? I'm well. Good. <laughs> Good. I, I sent you an email a couple of weeks ago uh, about some grass that we planted in our yard to cover up some bare spots, and uh, I didn't get the call last week, but the, I got this at the local garden center. I think I was looking for rye. I thought I got rye, but I put this out in the yard, and it is just kind of gone nuts, and yeah. it's, it, it's, a, uh, it's a grass that will probably grow it seems like it grows an inch or two inches overnight. Right. It's, it's gotten as tall as eight or nine inches, and it's real pretty. It's green. Mm-hmm. It, cover, it covered. But I'm wondering, is that going to die out, or uh, do you have any idea about that? Did, did you send it to the Garden Success email? I did. I okay. Did. And I, I had something come through basically with a phone number, and the last four numbers were 8667. Yeah, that's mine. That's that you. Okay, me. good. I yeah. just want to make sure we're talking about the same yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I looked at the grass and the pictures from a little bit of a distance, and it's hard to really identify. Some grasses, you literally have to get a grass blade right up close and look mm-hmm. at where the blade joins the the stem of the grass, I guess, and the, the, the structures that occur right there. It mm-hmm. looks like a rye to me. Uh, there are some other grasses that can have that look. It, you're pretty sure, though, that it came from the seed you planted. It didn't just happen to be right. a weed, that, right? Right, right, because yeah. it, it came up in the areas where I put the seed out, and there were okay. four or five areas where I put it out. Okay, yeah. and the seed was told to you to be rye? Uh, well, I don't honestly don't know. I went to a garden center. I was looking for rye, mm-hmm. and uh, I... I I thought I got rye, but I'm not. I'm not absolutely sure it was okay. rye. It might have been a rye mixture or something like that. It, it, it kind of looks like that's what it is. But mm-hmm. the bottom line is, uh, rye is a cool season grass, and the fact that it's the size it is now tells me that it's a cool season grass, whatever the name of it is. And right. those are going to be dying out. There are a few that kind of struggle on into summer, but in general, it's an it's an annual, so you don't want to let it go to right. seed. Uh, but you, I would just say mow like you would mow your lawn, fertilize you, fertilize your lawn, get your lawn good and dense, and yeah. it'll it'll go away, and then you shouldn't have a problem with it uh, going forward. Okay. okay. Well, I, I that, that's what I hope to hear, but uh, yeah. uh, anyway, well, I appreciate that. Uh, yeah. It, it, but it, it's amazing grass because, I mean, it was, yeah. with the rain we had and the fertilizer I put on it, it got to be almost a foot tall. Yeah, and, and there there are a number of grasses that are used for overseeding. You know, rye, there's a, an annual rye and a perennial rye, and mm-hmm. so those two uh, are a little bit different in how they grow. Uh, this one, sometimes the mixes have a blend of annual and perennial. The annual gives you the real quick color or quick growth, mm-hmm. and the right. perennial comes in a little longer but is a little bit better looking, I think, as a grass. Uh, but and then there's stuff that shouldn't be sold here that's got fescue and bluegrass and all kinds of other things in it, uh, mm-hmm. and it's just those big companies that sell all over the country, and so we end up getting it sure. in certain stores around here. Yeah. Okay. Well, that sounds real good. Well, I appreciate the comments and uh, and I appreciate the information. Thank all you right. very much. Well, all I right. appreciate the call. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Bye. 
Bye bye. Phone number 845 5689 845 5689 or by email at gardensuccess at tamu dot edu. Gardensuccess at tamu dot edu. Uh, I want to talk about some things that are going on around town. Uh, we've got a couple of really big deals out at the gardens on campus on West Campus, uh, the gardens at Texas A&M University. Uh, Saturday, this Saturday, April 22nd, is the Hullabloom Fest. I wonder if I should say Hullabloom or Hullabaloom. <laughs> anyway, Hullabaloom, Hullabloom Fest is from 9 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. So it's in the morning, and spring has exploded at the gardens. If you haven't seen them, oh my gosh, it is gorgeous out there. It's always gorgeous out there. The, uh, Joseph Johnson and uh, the crew and everybody out there just does such a good job of, of uh, keeping that thing in, in top shape. Uh, but this is a free family fun event. So uh, it's kind of their spring celebration. They're going to have some refreshments. Uh, you can visit various educational demonstrations and activity tables. The kids will really like this. They'll be able to make spring inspired crafts, learn about pollinators, all things that are pollinators, and even participate in a butterfly release that's going to be going on. So go out to the gardens on Saturday from 9 a.m., 11.30 a.m., and check it out. Number one, it's worth going just to see the gardens. But if you if you wanted to uh, also enjoy the event, well, you certainly have that. Uh, so the, the website is gardens.tamu.edu. You know, all our A&M websites, I, I, I wish I could just quit saying tamu.edu because everything ends in that. Fireant.tamu.edu. Yeah, it's in, you know, plantclinic.tamu.edu, soiltesting.tamu.edu. So anyway, gardens.tamu.edu. And on there, you'll see the Hullabloom Fest. Uh, and uh, you can click on that and find more information, information about parking and whatnot like that as well. Now, the next Saturday, Saturday the 29th, as part of our series called In the Dirt with Master Gardeners, our Brazos County Master Gardener team is putting on a plant propagation class. Now this will be from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. on Saturday the 29th, 10 a.m. to 11.30. And it'll be in the pavilion, the big um, multi-sided building right in the middle of the gardens. Uh, some of our Brazos County Master Gardeners that, that uh, help by doing educational programs on how to propagate plants will be there. They'll have some handouts for you, but they'll also have a lot of examples and, and things that you can see how to get this done. Uh, plant propagation, I would say, is probably gardening 2.0, and here's what I mean by that. Gardening 1.0 is just figuring out how to have good dirt, how to plant good seeds, how to take care of your plants, and so on. But once you've become pretty good at gardening, and you don't have to wait to go to 2.0, but then you start to get interested in other things like, I would like to be able to propagate plants. I would like to be able to grow seeds better. I would like to learn how to have success with seeds. Or, uh, you know, maybe you, you see a plant and you would like to get a cutting of it or learn about other ways to propagate. That opens up a whole new world. And uh, it is it is a lot of fun. And so uh, this also is free. Both of these, the Saturday, the this coming Saturday, 22nd, Hullabaloom Fest, 9 to 11.30, and In the Dirt with Master Gardeners Plant Propagation the next Saturday, April 29th, from 10 to 11.30. And again, gardens.tamu.edu to find out about uh, how and where to park. Uh, it's free. Uh, the event's free. And on the weekends, you can actually get out there and get some good parking. Uh, so I would encourage you to take advantage of that. Those, those will be awesome. Take your camera, too, by the way. Take pictures of the kids in the gardens. Take pictures of the gardens and the plants. Uh, and you'll see all the kinds of plants that uh, you absolutely can't live without. Our phone number is 979-845-5689, 845-5689, or by email, gardensuccess at tamu dot edu garden success at tamu.edu now next tuesday april 25th the brass county master gardener association is having a program at the extension office at 7 p.m 
And uh, this is one of their program series that they do pr educational programs every month. Uh, if you want to learn more about their programs and also things going on around town, go to the website brazosmg.com, B-R-A-Z-O-S-M-G.com, and you can find out about that. This program will be called Horticulture, Horticultural Wonders of the World, and Dr. Tim Davis will be speaking uh, at that. Uh, uh, he used to be with the horticulture department here. He works with the Borlaug, I believe now. Uh, Tim is a wealth of information, and he has traveled extensively, and he will give you some amazing wow uh, factor on the horticulture wonders of the world. That's free at 7 p.m. at the Extension Office. By the way, the Extension Office is on County Park Court. Uh, if you have property and pay your property taxes, we're right next to that building. So that's another way to find us. Uh, also going on, uh, Producers Co-op has a series that's been going on all through April. It's their Spring Garden Seminar Series. And at, they begin at 1 o'clock in the Conference Center, which is a, a different building than, you know, when you used to walk in to go to a class at Producers. It was off in a corner of the building. But this is in the Conference Center. And uh, it is going to be on, on this Saturday, April 22nd. From It's called Insect and Weed Control, and Fred Heck, who is a rep from Fertilome Company, is going to be talking about insect and weed control at a producer's co-op. So, boy, do you ever have a busy Saturday planned, you know, in the morning, heading out to the gardens and enjoying that, in the afternoon, learning about insect and weed control. Uh, pretty fun, pretty cool stuff. Well, let's see, I'm going to talk a little bit more on the, some of the emails that have come in, and let me find my way over to that here. Uh, there is something, uh, uh, Jenny has sent a picture of a giant white uh, spider lily plant. And it's like a fungal growth kind of thing, brown, fuzzy stuff all around the base. And I don't believe that that, Jenny, is a disease of the plant. I think it's something growing on the plant. We have different kinds of fungi. You may have noticed sometime in, in, a, in a lawn that you had, a St. Augustine lawn, that there was just this gray and then black coating on the, on the grass blades, as just like a fungus just growing all over it. That's superficial, and uh, you can spray it off or it'll just wear off but it's not a disease of it. And this looks a lot like that to me. Now, there may be some physical injury there. Uh, as I look at the picture, I don't see that those spots are attacking the, the lily and the, the foliage out from that looks, looks good. So I'm thinking that this is just something superficial. Uh, just kind of rub it off with your hand and, and I would say ignore it uh, for now. Uh, if it were to progress, let me know. We could we could try some sort of a fungicide, but those lilies are tough. I mean, giant white spider lilies and uh, crinum lilies. Oh my gosh, they just they live in a bar ditch with no care at all, and they live forever. And uh, so I'm not concerned right now from what I see in the picture of what you have. That's another reason, by the way, to to plant naturalizing bulbs, bulbs that will establish themselves and come back year after year. And not all bulbs are naturalizing. Uh, if you've seen fields of tulips, oh my goodness, they are gorgeous, right? But when you come over here, you plant them and you get one bloom from them, one season of bloom. So you plant them and not very long after that, they're blooming and then they're done. And then maybe they live to next year, but they won't be impressive at all if they do. Uh, we call them one-shot wonders. Uh, hyacinth can be a one-shot wonder, the big standard tall uh, hyacinths. Uh, and there's others. There's daffodils that do well here and daffodils that don't. They don't naturalize well. So when you're purchasing your plants, and, and I would recommend going to a good quality mom and pop uh, place that knows what they have and what they're selling, and uh, those kinds of, of uh, operations can direct you to good naturalizing bulbs. Uh, you know, Farm Patch downtown, I'm sure they get some bulbs in at Producers and down at uh, uh, Antique Rose Emporium. I know they get stuff in down there. And just ask for, I want bulbs that naturalize. And we have them. We have daffodils. We have paper whites. Uh, the uh, uh, fall uh, blooming, early or late summer, early fall blooming schoolhouse lily, uh, also called oxblood lily. Uh, there are spider lilies. 
uh, of various types, a red spider lily and, and so on. But let them direct you to that because then, you know, there's nothing wrong with a one-shot wonder. I mean, we do it all the time. When you plant pansies, you don't expect them to be there for years. You get your winter your winter uh, color out of them and then they're gone. And the same is true with petunias and marigolds and other things. But when you're investing in bulbs, to invest in one that's going to come back over and over again, that's just a, a return on your investment every year, a blooming return on your investment. So I would consider, I would consider that as you're out uh, looking for things to plant. Well, let's see. Are we gonna are we gonna have a day where Skip talks all day <laughs> today? Uh, we give us a call if you'd like to visit about something. Nine seven nine eight four five five six eight nine. It's kind of quiet and with spring going on. I know what's happening. Everybody's out working in the yard right now, and so anyway, we'll be happy to visit about anything you want to identify or any ideas you have or need some suggestions and so on. Uh, I had a, a question from Des, and Des is wanting to plant a flowering vine that will attract pollinators and, and or hummingbirds. Uh, there are some three foot wide, uh, 12 foot tall areas where a vine could go, as well as on perhaps a metal fence that they have. And most spots are full sun, and one is part sun, and all have good drainage. Well, there's a lot of good vines. Now, when it comes to the pollinators and the hummingbirds, uh, I'm going to have to, I would have to probably look carefully at a list rather than trying to go off the top of my head. But uh, one of the vines that I think is just great is um, the um, uh, cross vine. Uh, cross vine uh, does well for us. There is a, a variety called tangerine beauty. Now there's the native cross vine, which is kind of a, a yellow brown orangish flower. Uh, it's really attractive. It's a native version. And then Tangerine Beauty is, well, more of a, I'm, I'm color challenged, but uh, Tangerine may be a good name for it. I think of it as a, like, look at a tangerine and go a little toward pink is what, what it reminds me of. But anyway, uh, that's a good one. Now these vines, they run. And I mean, if you planted them at one end of a chain link fence, they, they'd go all the way to the other end. Uh, they're not invasive, but but they they take off so when you plant a cross vine you want to put it on something where it can't grow on that and then jump over and grab onto a power line or <laughs> go up a windmill or something else uh, but I, I like those a lot uh, we have uh, a couple of types of uh, jasmine a confederate jasmine uh, and uh, let's see there's another one that's escaping me right now in fact there are several jasmines some of those have a nice fragrance and they would be uh, attractive in that for a, a tamer vine, I like uh, the coral honeysuckle. Don't plant the white and red one. That It smells good, but it is super invasive. And avoid that one. But coral honeysuckle, uh, well, let's call it a very tame vine. And uh, I think that it is really beautiful. And I know hummingbirds love that one. And I'm going to pause Des on this question and go ahead and go to the phones. Uh, our number, 979-845-5689. Uh, first, we're going to talk to Bren. Hello, Bren. Hi. Yes. I, my neighbors and I have fields of lovely blue bonnets and Indian paintbrushes, but they have been uh, infestated with these very terrible thistle plants and there's two kinds of thistle plants one that that grows really tall and has multiple branches and then there's the one that's very compact but very prickly and it comes up with just a one stalk but multiple blooms and i've been out multiple times digging them hitting, the, hitting them with a shovel at the base but then yeah. meticulously cutting off the heads and putting them in a bag and, and but they're just everywhere. Right. What can we do? Well, but once our you know blue bonnets and I guess the paintbrushes too kind of have done their seed production, uh, those those plants are going to go away. Uh, and I would consider a, a broadleaf product that would kill the thistles because some of the thistles are perennials and some are, are annuals. Uh, but you could get rid of them that way by just spot spraying. Now, if you're talking about a huge, huge area like you described and you have a whole lot of them, that may be a little tedious, but not as tedious as hand pulling them. Uh, that's for sure. 
so those those would kind of be your options there. Uh, at the very least, cutting off the flower stalks so that um, you're not producing more thistle seed to float around and and make it even worse. So even when you cut them and they're immature, they seem to be able to generate some seeds. Yeah. So. Yeah, I know. It. That's why you know I mentioned the spraying because that way you know you can shut them down. But once any kind of weed becomes reproductive, meaning it's flowering and setting seed, uh, those products are not as effective uh, on it. And that's a generalization. But uh, so I would I would definitely try to get it done earlier. Uh, because even if you okay. killed it, if it already developed viable seed, they're just going to come up next year. Uh-huh. Well, thank you very much. All right, Elma. Thank you. All right. Bren, thank you for the call. Appreciate that. Okay. Uh, let's now go to the phones and talk to John. Hey, John. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I just got, a, a, oh, maybe 100 square feet of my garden area cleared and ready to do something with. What, what, do you, what should I put in now to get something? Uh, you talking about a vegetable? Yes. Well, okay. yes. I, not flowers. Well, let I me ask. Eat. Let me ask this: What What do you already have, uh, and or what do you like to grow? What do you like to eat? Right now, of course, we've got uh, a, a lot of tomato plants in the process of setting fruit. Mm -hmm. They're coming on, and we've got uh, Brussels sprouts that are also well along. Mm -hmm. Carrots, onions, potatoes. Okay, so all that is going to be coming out. Um, so, you know, for the summer, we have the traditional things, and then we have some things you probably never heard of that, that will grow here and do well. Uh, the traditional would be bla uh, black-eyed peas, uh, okra. Uh, let's see, there was something that just... Oh, sweet potatoes. Uh, uh, that, that's We're getting into that time to plant pretty quick here. And uh, those all are going to go through the summer that kind of is traditional crops for you. And when I say black eye peas, of course, I'm talking about all the southern peas, black eyes, purple hulls, pink eye, crowder peas, zipper cream peas. You get the idea. Uh, right. So all of those could, could go in. Uh, but then there's some unusual things. Uh, I don't know if you've ever grown Malabar before. Uh, when we don't know what to call a green, we put spinach in the name. And I wish we wouldn't do that, but you'll, it'll be called Malabar spinach. It, has n it is not spinach. Uh, but it, it does, you know, well in the summer. It's a little bit, it has that uh, slimy character that okra can have. Right. So that's just something to be aware of. Some people aren't real crazy. There's another green called Molokia, and it's it's uh, real popular uh, in several parts of the world, including the Mideast. But it, it is a, a um, relative of jute. And so here I'm telling you, you're going to eat something that's kin to jute. That doesn't sound palatable, right? But seriously, it, it you can make fibers from it. But you pick the young tender leaves, and the, the spelling is M-O-L-O-K-H-I-A, like Moloch and then Hia, H-I-A. Now, there are other versions, depending on which culture you're talking to, they're going to have a little different twist on that name. Uh, but it grows like a weed. I grow amaranth. Uh, there are, which is to the farmers, they call them pigweed, uh, but amaranth, the vegetable types, uh, have very large leaves and they do really well. There's one with red stripe leaves and one with all green leaves. Uh, there is a version that's called Callaloo. It's more of a, a popular in the Caribbean uh, dishes, but it's just a green. And I mean, so if you just want fresh greens, that's that Callaloo or the amaranths would be good. Uh, there's even a type of celosia that's grown uh, for its green. So uh, lots of lots of options, you know, the traditional. And then if you're willing to explore the world, we can pull out a lot of things from places in the world that think our summers are not hot and humid. <laughs> you know, you were talking about Malabar. Mary planted Malabar. It's been probably four years ago. Mm -hmm. And I'm just now about to get rid of... <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like y'all Malabar because <laughs> it makes it makes a zillion seeds. Yes, yes. And, and then they all fall right where you're growing them. All so right. You, you, they just 
Yeah, they're tough. I know, I know. Well, obviously, you're not a fan of Malabar, <laughs> so well, it just it just kind of overwhelmed. Yeah. Well, yeah. let me let me say this: all the things I'm talking about will do the same thing. I mean, they produce <laughs> seed. You just have to cut the seed heads off, you know, before they develop. Uh, but amaranth, oh my gosh, one amaranth plant probably produces two hundred thousand seed, and uh, but you don't have to let that happen. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, what, anyway. what, do you, what do you do with amaranth? How do you, you prepare it? Uh, it's well, the the kind I'm talking about is is the foliage that you pick and eat, and and you would do it like you do spinach or other greens. I mean, you could mm -hmm. kind of steam it. You could actually cook it. I generally like with spinach, prefer not to cook it too much, but to use it as fresh as possible. Uh, but that same is true with amaranth. Then there's amaranths that are grown for the grain, but that's a whole nother process and trying to. Uh, thrash out those little tiny seeds and use them is not going to be practical for 99% of the gardeners. Yeah. Okay, yeah. well, I, I know, I mean, the re part of the reason nobody's calling you is almost, you know, everything is halfway done right now. And you <laughs> really, I mean, yeah. all you can do is pull weeds now. Yeah, well, yeah. there you go. There you go. You know, you can eat sweet potato vine, too. That's another one. I uh, have to go online and and check that in, check into that. But I don't know. I was it probably the last three or four years that I actually found out you could eat sweet potato vine. My whole life, I didn't I didn't know that was a thing. Oh, I didn't either. I never heard that. Yeah, and but, there's uh, and of course you're a proponent of going and getting the slips that that produce yes. a co-op or whatever yes. instead of trying mm -hmm. to grow your own. Yep, and take you know plant them, take good care of them, do it right. Um, I, I have a write-up that I send out when people ask for it, but it basically is how to have good-sized sweet potatoes. And you may have noticed sometimes you plant them and you get these little things that are about as big as your thumb around. Uh, I've and, done that. And there's, right. there's things culturally that we do that make the plant prone toward that kind of thing. Uh, and then there's things culturally we do. You want a good, thick uh slip, uh, which is basically, for those who haven't grown sweet potatoes, it's just a, a section of the shoot, of the, of the vine. Uh, and we just stick it in the ground and it roots. Uh, but anyway, yeah, the, you you can have good success with it. I'm trying to think of some other summer vegetables. I know there's some out there that are just not not occurring to me. Uh, you know, you can take melons, cantaloupes, watermelons, and things like that on into summer, uh, too. Uh, but anyway, that that's more than enough to, to get going. Right. We're having real good luck with our, our summer squash this year. I mean, we we keep looking for the the evil one. But uh -huh. we, uh, we've been fortunate so far. We, we've been able to avoid them. Yeah. By well, removing that's, whatever we can. Th yeah, that is good. And, and you can kind of keep it going. Uh, those things love to spoil the show. Yeah, you're so, right. Anyway. <laughs> You've even got some spaghetti squash going. There you go. It's, 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 it's a long vine. It's going up the, up the trellis. It is. It has, it has great aspirations to be a world traveler, and, um, but it sounds like you've got it kind of corralled, so you should Well, have. It's, on, it's, on a, it's on a trellis, so it's, okay. it's working its way up. Yeah, there's those winter storage types of squashes like spaghetti squash, acorn squash, uh, butternut squash. What's the other one? Uh, kabocha types of squash. Those are those are nice. We we have problems with foliage diseases sometimes on them. That's that's the big problem. Powdery mildew and some other things just destroy all the green leaf area, and then you know you can't produce carbohydrates to make that fruit you're wanting to eat. We haven't seen that. And I, one other thing I want to mention: our Don Juan rose is it. It looks like the the parade in in the California's rose bowl. I mean, it is it is just totally. There must be hundreds. Of wow, flowers. That's cool. Well, if uh, you know, if you ever get a chance to take a f digital photo of it and email it, I, I sure would be interested in seeing it because I always love to see. Uh, you know, plants in people's yards that have re that are really performing well. I'm gonna. I'll do that this afternoon. In fact, I'll, uh, I'll send you a picture of it. 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 She in fact took a bunch of roses off of it today, just trying to make sure it's got a lot of the roses on. We get company coming. Uh huh. Yeah, but it's uh, it it has been really prolific this this spring. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, good. Well, it sounds like you're doing all the good out there. Okay. Well, uh, thanks for all your help, Skip. I appreciate uh, it. All right, John. Thanks for the call. I appreciate that. Our phone number is 979-845-5689. 979-845-5689. Or by email, you can speak to me at, uh, or re reach out to me with some photos at Garden Success at tamu dot edu garden success one word at tamu dot edu i would uh, talk about some things going on around town oh i'll tell you what we're going to go ahead and take a call from susan and uh, then we'll go to what's happening around town oh uh, hello susan hello rick i skip how are you i'm well thank you well, last year, I heard a conversation you had with someone on eggplants, okay. and I have fallen in love with eggplants, so I've got two varieties that I've planted, so I kind of remember you talking about that as soon as you put them in the ground, the bugs find them immediately, or something gets them, Okay. so I this is my first time growing them, so tell me the lowdown on what to look for and for the what eggplant. should I spray them with or mm -hmm. yeah so so I don't remember that conversation of course but I can just tell you the answer to your question and if, if I talked about an insect on eggplants I was probably talking about flea beetles and they're little black beetles that are oh gosh they're you know the pins that have the little round plastic ball on the end, the, the stick pins yeah. you know yeah. they're about the size of that ball on the end of, of that pin not a pinhead but that that kind of thing and uh, they're black and they they can hop that's why they have the name flea beetle so it's kind of hard to catch them uh, but they eat little holes and it looks like someone shot your eggplant leaves with a shotgun you know little round holes all in them and when the eggplant are young that's when they can occur in large numbers and when they do they take out enough of the leaf area that it really sets them back sets the eggplants back once you get up to about six leaves on an eggplant transplant the, the flea beetles are not going to be a concern. It's going to be growing fast enough, and it, it's just not going to be an issue. But So it's with the new transplants that you want to watch for that. You may not have them, but uh, inevitably I, I have struggles with flea beetles and, on eggplant. Uh, so uh, as far as you know, taking care of them, kind of like you would a tomato. A good soaking, but not keeping it too wet. Uh, good, uh, some fertilizer to keep it boost and growing, because... Uh, you know, the more the eggplant grows, the more spots you have where there'll be blooms and then fruit. And so, you know, a larger plant's going to be capable of producing more fruit than a small plant. So a decent, moderate fertilization would be also important. Okay. Do you remember what variety you have by any chance? Oh, I don't. That's okay. Um, That's all right. Not really. A fancy something or another. Okay. A fancy... I know that's one. So but, there, there's um, a, maybe I had an army worm problem because I know that I saw a couple of army worms around mm -hmm. and like half a leaf was like totally gone okay. overnight. And I didn't know, I really didn't know what the issues were with eggplants. Well, you know, there are a lot of caterpillars out in the world. And, and so a lot of things could be chewing on that leaf. If you go out at, if you don't see them during the day, go out at night and see if you see them. Some insects are nocturnal. And they kind of hide during the day, and then they feed at night. So at night with a flashlight, if you've got a culprit that you can't catch in the act, you might you might catch them then and find out what's going on. The, you know, eggplants, there's a lot of different types. There's some that are really unusual, like white or striped with purple and white or all kinds of things like that. But, but I think of eggplants as two groups. There's the big oval traditional type, uh, like Black Beauty, that's probably the most famous eggplant variety that's really yeah. large and then there are the kinds that are long and skinny some of them are about the size of a cucumber uh, a longer cucumber and then some of them are even smaller than that there's one that's not much wider than an inch maybe inch and a quarter uh, and I like those type better uh, I just the big slices of the big one are kind of hard to deal with unless you're making baba ganoush or some other eggplant dish and you just want that big eggplant uh, type. But I, I tried some new varieties uh, was it last year and they're in the, they're, they're, they're fairy tale names. One is called Hansel, 
like Hansel and Gretel, and I think the other one's called Fairy Tale, I believe. But when you see the names, you think of fairy tales. I know that. I think Fairy Tale is the name of yeah. one of them. Yeah, and, and it, then I have the traditional one. Yeah, well, the fairy well, the fairy tale and the and the Hansel both. I had them in, I don't know, maybe a something about like a large. Um, whiskey half whiskey barrel kind of planter and i had two mm-hmm. or three of them in there and oh my gosh they really produced so well last year i went for the first time and found the um little garden area by the extension i guess the old extension office yes mm-hmm. i'm not sure what that garden area is called out there by the john deere dealership right and there was a gorgeous egg plant there and that's what inspired me <laughs> okay um I don't so. I don't remember what the Master Gardeners planted. We call that the DIG, which stands for Demonstration Idea yes, Garden. And uh, you can go visit, those of you who are listening to the show, you can go out there and visit anytime. It's on Highway 21. Uh, if you're in Bryan heading like you're going to go to Caldwell, it's right before you cross over 2854. Is that right? Is that the right number? Anyway, the bypass around the west side of town, uh, it's on the left. And you can't miss it when you're driving down Highway 21. But yeah, yeah that's a neat garden. Yeah, it is. It is neat. And they occasionally, you know, they have their work days uh, scattered throughout the month. And uh, if you catch them out there, that's especially nice because you can visit with master gardeners, learn yeah. a little bit more. Well, I appreciate the information. Hopefully, I'll be eating eggplant this year. All right. Good. <laughs> Thank you. You bet. Thank you very much. Yeah, eggplant is one of those things that can really get into the summer. It, it's better in the summer than like tomatoes would be. Tomatoes kind of quit setting and they're not very happy. Peppers aren't even very happy in the summer a lot of times. Uh, they like spring and they like fall. Uh, but anyway, the eggplant is a, is a pretty tough pretty tough cookie. You just don't want to let them get too mature. Uh, they, you know, they have a nice shiny skin and if that skin is dulling a little bit, uh, not quite as glossy, that's one you probably don't want to eat. And so uh, just kind of watch on the harvesting on those. Our phone number is 979-845-5689, 845-5689, or by email at gardensuccess at tamu.edu. I want to mention a couple things here. Okay, the post oak chapter of the Native Plant Society of Texas. Post Oak Chapter is our local chapter. Good name for it. We live in the Post Oak Belt here. Uh, But the Post Oak Chapter of Native Plant Society of Texas on Saturday, May 13th. Now, though that's far ahead, but you're not going to want to miss this one. But they're having another uh, plant sale uh, this this, uh, coming May 13th. It'll be from 9 a.m. to noon. And uh, don't try to get there early and talk them out of plants. They don't start selling until 9 a.m., it's fair for everybody. And it's out at Lick Creek Park, which is out Rock Prairie Road, east of town. So they will have things like, uh, of course, they're going to be growing natives, but uh, things like American basket flower, uh, blue mist flower. Uh, I mentioned coral honeysuckle uh, earlier. They'll have coral honeysuckle out there. Uh, they will have uh, the golden wave tick seed and lance leaf coreopsis and yellow columbine, which is a type, a native. Do you know Texas has a couple of native columbines? Two to my, to my knowledge. One is yellow. Uh, we often call it Hinkley's columbine, uh, but it has big flowers with long spurs. You know, columbines have these spurs off the back of the flower. Uh, and, and it does well uh, here. Uh, it, you Columbines are going to be growing through the cool season and then blooming in the spring. And often they survive until the next year. I wouldn't consider them a perennial like one plant's going to last five years or ten years for you. Uh, but uh, they do reseed. The other one's a, the, the other columbine, and this is not one at the sale, but uh, is commonly found in some of the seeps and springs of central Texas. And it's a red columbine. Uh, and it's a much smaller flower. Uh, but uh, one thing that's cool, if you can find both of them and plant them together, they cross. And the next year, you will get some very interesting blooms that look structurally and size-wise like the yellow columbine, but have the red color also coming into them. I just think it's cool. But anyway, columbines are native here. They uh, are also going to have frog fruit. If you are not familiar with frog fruit, it is a ground cover that is native. 
uh, it is an excellent ground cover and you can go out in the country around here and I've seen it a million places but it's growing along the ground little vines along the ground very low like we're talking maybe two three maybe not even three inches high uh, and then it sends up these little bloom stalks that are nothing to write home about but when you look at a bunch of them blooming it's very attractive and uh, it survives here on no care at all that's it think of it as a wild weed but it's a weed uh, everything we grow as a weed somewhere uh, and and uh, this frog fruit makes a really nice ground cover so if you want a native ground cover that is uh, drought resistant uh, frog fruit is one you should check out and they're going to have it at the uh, plant sale of the post oak chapter of native plant society saturday may 13th lick creek park 9 a.m to, to 12 noon they got some other plants that they're also selling out there. But anyway, that's a few of them just to give you an idea. Uh, oh, there is one. There's one I want to mention. It's called frostweed. And if you've never grown frostweed, you know, my, this is my personal opinion, uh, but I'm not that uh, amazed by the plant itself. It's, it's, you know, it's a plant, but it, it's not like traffic stops because there's a frostweed plant in the yard. But in, in, when we have freezes, the uh, material in the stem oozes out and freezes in a white, beautiful, it just looks like ice. Well, I guess technically it kind of is. But on the plant, it's, it's really unusual. Go online and do a search for frost weed. Uh, and the, the genus is Verbesina, V-E-R-B-E-S-I-N-A. And, and just look at pictures of what it looks like in the cool season. And I, that's, I think, the reason, uh, really, that I would, would be interested in growing it. Uh, they also have a, a, um, a uh, rose mallow. It's a hibiscus species uh, that is called Hallbred Leaf Rose Mallow, and they're going to have those out there. So it sounds like I need to run out there and get some plants. That is going on. Okay, uh, we have a question uh, on oh no a phone call from Syed so let me go to Syed how are you today I'm doing fine thank you how are you doing? good I thought I thought you had gotten mad at me I hadn't heard from you in a while <laughs> <laughs> never never you're such a sweet person nobody would ever get mad at you <laughs> well uh, my question is about uh, uh, control of your pond that I have now a major problem along my fence line. I've been living out in the country and, and uh, it's a board fence that I have, which is about 600 feet long. And uh, I'm having a major problem with with uh, your pond, you know, on the ground and, uh -huh. and uh, along the fence. Uh, is there anything that uh, I can do to so at least control it, not get rid of it completely, but at least control it. Yes, yes, you can. Uh, so the, the way you're going to control it is to use a uh, product that kills brush. And the ingredient, if you want to write this down, because there's a lot of brand names out there, yeah. Um, yeah. but it's triclopyr, T-R-I-C-L-O-P-Y-R triclopyr and it's used by ranchers to kill brush in the pastures uh, but there are home and garden versions of triclopyr that will have names like um, uh, poison ivy killer or brush be gone or names like that but anyway yeah. we're, go go to a place that carries you know a good selection of products and ask them for uh, something that has triclopyr in it and okay. so what let me see. I think we thought we had a. Here we go. Yeah, there used to be a site called Brush Busters. Uh, it was an A and M site, and I'm not seeing it right now. But if you do a search for Brush Busters, and then you put in Yopon, uh, there there will be uh, information on how you do what's called a stump cut spray. Okay. So what happens is you uh, get this material and you mix it into some diesel just diesel fuel or you can use vegetable oil from the kitchen but you mix it in this will tell you this this website will tell you how much percent of whatever to use and you spray it on the base of the stems 
uh, that's one way. Another way is you cut the Yopon off or, or whatever hackberry, whatever kind of thing you're wanting to get rid of. And when you cut it immediately, you uh, paint that cut. In other words, you spray the cut, or I, I typically will use, if it's just a few, one of those little foam brushes, like paint brushes, but they're foam on a stick, uh, and just get it on there and then dab it on the cut right away. You don't do it right away. Don't wait and three days later do it. Uh, right. But but the triclopyr will control it. Uh, the, the, the diesel oil helps it to really stick and not just roll off. Uh, and so... Um, yeah, that or I say diesel. Vegetable oil could also be used. I suspect that's going to be more handy for you than diesel oil. Uh, but that that's how I would get rid of the, the yopon on a long area like that where you're not going to be able to just dig it up. It's very difficult to control. Otherwise, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, that's, that's going to help me. Uh, I'll, I'll try this and I'll, I'll keep you posted how it develops. Well, good. I appreciate yeah. your help. Yeah. I mean, I appreciate it. Well, thank you. Thank you for the call. Take good care of yourself. Thank you very much. You as well. All right. Now let's go to the phones and talk to Greg. Hello, Greg. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I sent you an email. I don't have a chance to see it. It's about a drift rose. Uh, Let me go back and look. Maybe I missed it. I was out last week. and I I just sent it about an hour ago. oh. Oh. Oh, gosh. My goodness. There are a bunch of them appeared here. (laughs) Ah, <laughs> uh, boy. Okay, Drift Rose. I got it. And I included two pictures. Yeah, I, d- I see those. That's beautiful. Uh, so, uh, the, yeah, the the bush doesn't look beautiful, but Drift Roses are beautiful. Uh, <laughs> so you've got thrips on it? Is that what's going well, on? I had thrips last year. We, we tried to treat them as frequently as we could, and they don't appear, and they were bad, bad, bad. But they don't appear to be at least present yet. And the, as you can tell from the, the from the picture, the the bushes, the rose bush is doing great, ex- well, except for one side. And don't know what might be taking place on that side. We can't see any bugs. Haven't detected any, you know, anything chewing. Yeah. But yet, obviously, the one side is not doing as nearly as well as the majority of the bush. I see that. Are are, are you real sure that's two plants? I mean, one plant rather than two. It's it was planted as one. Many many years ago. I mean, I, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but it was certainly it is one, and it's got gotcha. It's grown. It's grown that way for years and years. Okay. Well, the first thing I was doing was looking for signs of rose rosette virus, and I don't see any signs on it. So that's good because that's a. Yeah. Not only is it a goner, but the rose next to it's a goner too. If it has a rose rosette, um, I I don't see any signs on it that would point to what's wrong. Uh, any chance that a herbicide could have been used around it that might have gotten on that part of the bush? Well, I will say it's impossible. But okay. Well, I'm not trying. <laughs> I try, I try, we try to be very careful. Yeah, I'm not trying to accuse you of anything here. And especially, I never would do that to a guy if, if their spouse was listening because, uh, the, you know, <laughs> that gets you in a lot of trouble. Seriously, right. though, I, I uh, think it's going to be okay. I see some new growth coming out. Uh, I cannot explain why that side is like that other than I do see some signs of weed weed killing around it. And so it may be that a super light dose got over there on it. And uh, that would be the only thing I can think of, uh, Greg, that uh, that fits the picture of what I'm seeing. And so it could recover over time from something. Yeah, like that. It, pr- it probably would. For a super, super, you know, light uh, contaminated spray coming, you know, a dose getting on it. Uh, it typically won't kill it, but it'll just make it sick. And so, I guess the last thing to ask is: there anything to else to like look for? You know, really up close. You know, the old where you shake it on a white piece of paper, anything right. like that to look for to see if there's something else that might that we're missing. Yep, that would be spider mites. We're a little early for them to be bad, uh, but I don't see signs of spider mites. They're gonna, you're gonna see the foliage color little stipples kind of fade out toward tan and uh but i and spider mites wouldn't just be on on that part of the bush they'd be all over but it's not spider mites i don't think it's rose rosette but i'd I'd keep watching it for that uh you can send samples into the plant clinic 
I just, man, I'm telling you, I, I see no, none of the characteristics of Rose Rosette. So I'm going to, I'm going to eliminate that one. And I'm about 98% sure. Well, okay. as you can tell overall, that is a very healthy, yes. or has been a very healthy drift rose. It's, it's just a tremendous bloomer. I highly advocate the drift roses. Yeah, it is, it is beautiful. Yeah, I believe that's it. Uh, so keep an eye on it. Call us back if if anything changes. But and, and anything anything other than a typical systemic for something for to try to combat the thrips if they're trying to if they try to come back or whatever. Uh, I mean, what's... Thrips are a challenge because th <laughs> they fly through the air by the bazillions. Especially you know as our blue bonnets and other wildflowers start to die down, we just get clouds of them. But uh, the product spinosad is an organic uh, natural product that okay. will do a pretty good job on thrips you just have to spray it now here's the problem thrips become resistant really easily so if you use spinosad five times a year for five years you are going to have resistant thrips for sure so we like to kind of alternate between spinosad and other things just so we don't lose access to that effective product right spinosa s-p-i-n-s-o-a or whatever you call it s-p-i-n-o-s-a-d and it comes okay. in a lot of brands, uh, you know, places that carry a lot of product, like a producer co-op type place would, is going to have several versions probably of Spinosad uh, there. All right. Thank you. Okay. Good luck with it, Greg. Thanks for the call. Oh, my gosh. We're down to a minute. Boy, that went fast. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to... Okay, uh, see if we can fit this in. Elizabeth has two Japanese ewes that are turning brown. She checked around it. It's irrigated, moderately moist. Uh, does it need more moisture? What's going on? That is cold damage, uh, Elizabeth. And this December freeze caught our ewes, Y-E-W, not ready for it. And we've seen that kind of damage. So I would watch it. Once you know an area is dead, printing out, it'll regrow. Uh, but uh, that, I'm about 90% sure that's coal damage. All right, well, you've been listening to Garden Success. I'm your host, Skip Richter. We're here every Thursday from 12 to 1. Uh, you can also reach us in the meantime at gardensuccess at tamu.edu, and I'll be happy to answer your questions at that time. For those of you that emailed and I couldn't get to it, uh, I will, I'll jump on those uh, next week on the show. You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley.